Hello. Good afternoon. Here we are again. Um, can you guys hear me? Are we on? Oh, thank you. Hmm. Check, check, check. There it is. Okay. Good afternoon. Thanks for being here today. Uh, I'm Lauren Metch. I'm the instructor for Music Convocation. So let me just say right off the bat, I know there are people here for credit for several different things. So if you're in my class, you need to swipe in and swipe out as you usually would. If you're in a music history class and you're here for credit for that, I saw a sign out sheet out in the hallway. So if you're in both, definitely do both of those things, okay? If you just do one or the other, you might not get credit for both. And then there were some people asking me about a program, so maybe you're here for an intro to music or something like that. We don't have a program this afternoon, but I would just recommend you just turn around and take a selfie with this in the background, and then your teacher, you know, send that to them, and then they will know that you were here. Um, any questions about that, how to get credit for today? Again, for my class, do make sure you swipe in and on the way out, as you always do. Um, as far as seminar or recital class or music convocation, it's called many things <laughs> these days, Music 100. We only have two Fridays left after this, um, and so those are going to be our student showcase performances. They're open to the public and the School, school of Music at large, but those are going to be your pink performance and collaboration credits that you may need. So. Um, those are always really, really good high-level recitals, so you're going to want to attend those. They really are um, a good time, a, a good variety of very high-level undergraduate performances. Um, of course, you're going to hear some more about the event that's happening tonight that you can also get credit for. And I also wanted to remind you quickly about Jazz Girls Day at USC. This is a program that we are taking around the state of South Carolina to get more girls involved in playing jazz, and we are having basically a practice jazz girls day on the afternoon of November 30th, which is a Wednesday at 2.20. So if you're an orchestra, you may have rehearsal at that time. I that is their normal time, but maybe, maybe they're finished by then, I don't know. <clears throat> but if you want to attend that and hang out with us, you don't have to play a jazz instrument, you don't have to be a girl, you don't have to know anything about jazz, you can be anybody. Uh, singer, instrumentalist, doesn't matter, and you can hang out with us that day, and you can actually get a point in that orange category that a lot of people have been worried about getting points in. <laughs> um, there are also two new orange assignments that went up last night in Blackboard. So before we begin, are there any other questions about Music 100 class right now? Awesome. Okay, then we'll move right on to the next part. Check, check. Great. Thanks, Lauren. I'm Greg Stewart. I'm the director of the Peak Colloquium series. So in addition to uh, Music 100 and other uh, courses, this is also an event in the Music History Area's Peak Colloquium series. Um, today's event and then tonight at 7.30 will be our final event uh, for the semester. So we have Erin Demostis from Louisiana, Louisiana State University. She'll be offering a talk here in just a second called Composing with Objects and Unconventional Instruments. And then later tonight at 7.30 p.m. here, Aaron will be doing a performance with the Experimental Music Workshop. Uh, this is an ensemble that I run through the South Carolina Honors College. I'll be premiering a new piece, a uh, new ensemble work of Aaron's called How To. Tonight, in addition, Aaron will be doing a solo performance and will be doing music by the legendary experimental composer, Anaya Lockwood. So, our, on to our guest uh, today. Aaron Demostis is an experimental composer, performer, and instrument maker whose research combines sound and technology with humor, drama, and absurdity. She uses everyday household objects and hacked electronics for her installations and performances and subverts their use and perception with play and experimentation. In addition to her interest in physical materials, Aaron also experiments with instruction and interaction design by playing with the boundaries of her scores, performances, and installations to find a balance between structure and uncertainty. Erin received an MFA in Experimental Sound Practices and Integrated Media from California Institute of the Arts, a BM in Jazz Studies and Piano Performance from Loyola University, New Orleans, and is currently pursuing a doctorate in Experimental Music and Digital Media at Louisiana State University. 
She worked as an audio technician, artist, and educator for five years in Los Angeles, and as a jazz and classical pianist, composer, and arranger for 10 years in the New Orleans area. Please help me welcome Aaron Demostis. Hello, everyone. Thanks for braving the weather today to come hear this. Um, hopefully, you'll find it interesting and possibly entertaining. Um, so my practice, it's been a weird journey to, to, to get to this point. So we're going to go through it a little bit and kind of explain my research, um, the way I perform and why, and how I got from piano um, to this. Um, so, All right, so like Greg said, I have a background in jazz piano. So how did I get to experimental music? Well, I played piano for uh, about 20 years, and I remember thinking, wow, the piano does a few things, right? Uh, you can push the key down, you can hold the pedals down, you can play some chords, and you can play the inside of the, the piano. Um, so I started becoming interested in other forms of performing music that had maybe some different interactions. So, as one does, I went to electronic stuff, um, and there I found most things had buttons and knobs. Sometimes sliders, uh, sometimes screens. Um, so as I got more into electronics and digging on the inside of things and looking at the design and thinking about what's interesting, what's not, why are some instruments more you know, exciting to explore, especially like newer digital instruments, and why some things I get interested in for a few minutes and then I, I put it aside. <laughs> um, and then I kind of expanded outwards to just things in general. Um, first, it's you know the apps on your phone. Like, why are some games fun and some aren't? Um, you know, why when I open a door did I push it in when I should have pulled it? You know, stuff like that. I just started to kind of think about it in a grand scheme, and as a result, I started kind of trying to incorporate these thoughts into music. Um, yeah. Anyway. I digress. So my pieces often incorporate improvisation because I have a jazz background. Um, I think a lot about just the actual interaction with me and the instrument. I also think about myself and other people when I write for ensembles. Um, I also think about uh, improvisation and playing and reading scores kind of as um, not a game, but sort of, where like you have rules, a set of rules, and you're, you're kind of doing stuff within them. So my, um, as you can see, these pictures, there's a lot of different stuff that I've used. Um, so I kind of broke it down into three tiers. Um, I use found objects, just like random stuff. You'll see, if you go to the concert tonight, you'll definitely see some found objects. Um, stuff that you see in the grocery store, stuff that you see on the ground, stuff that you, you know, pass by, you know, solo cups, plastics, um, foil, whatever. Um, I also do hacked objects, which I kind of define as somewhere in between found and, and like designed, where you've designed a little bit of it, but a lot of it is kind of cobbled together. Um, that can be really fun. It can also be very precarious. I always bring extra batteries um, when that happens. Uh, there's been many times where I got a little too vigorous with something and I broke it. So, yeah, it happens. It's experimental music. <laughs> so, um, I also build objects. Um, I do circuitry, not at, at an engineering level, but I do what I can. Um, so we'll get to some of the like designs that I try to think about um, in a way that I, I try to design items that have a variety of interactions that are possible. So we'll, we'll get to that. Also, most of this is designed around having fun with it too. So um, in the top left, I created um, <coughs> This is what I call my slinky tubes. I put microphones in PVC, and uh, there's a lot of duct tape on that, which you can't see, uh, and attach it to slinkies. So that was one of my first hacked kind of creations. It's a coat rack, which I used for many years. Um, it's portable. Um, the second one right next to it is a piece that I made with cell phone buzzers and different resonant vases. Um, the one below, uh, let's see bottom left is a piece for a microscope camera. And the one, um, the last one is a piece for the 
this cell phone app that was supposed to be a microphone, but really it just fed back. Um, and that piece is really great, but then the app developer changed it so it works now, which is really bummer. I actually emailed him the piece and he didn't like it. So. Okay, before I show you kind of what I'm talking about, I wanted to just talk about the concepts you know, that I've been trying to research and apply to the artwork. Um, the way I work, and I'm sure a lot of composers and artists do the same, where you make something first and then people ask you why did you do it, and then you go back and you try to like kind of dissect your own work. Um, so that's kind of what I did. And um, so some things, some greater pictures that I like to think about in general, like how things work. I love that show, How It's Made. Do you guys watch that? It's pretty good. Learn all sorts of stuff, like how bubble gum is made, balloons, whatever, anything. Sunflower oil, you know, whatever. Anyway, um, I'm interested in how and why things were invented. Like, where was the hole that was filled with a certain technology and why was it there? Who thought of it? And problem solving in that kind of way. Um, and of course, how things are fabricated. Once you've decided you need something, how do you go about filling that need? Um, I think a lot about how we know how to use things and how we know how to do things. For instance, there are certain things in the products and objects that we use that are inherent. Like we grew up knowing how to use it. We know what a button and a handle's for. When there are orange cones, you have to figure out a way around them, right? Stuff, stuff like that that we kind of take for granted. Um, I like to think about and then either figure out a way to apply those concepts to writing music to get people to do stuff, or to do the opposite, <laughs> and to just kind of make people think about things uh, in a different way. Okay, so the books and research, um, these are my four favorite books currently, and um, the first one at the top left is called The Design of Everyday Things. It's by Don Norman, who works at UCSD in the design school. And he writes a lot about just basic design, like handles, doors. His big complaint is about <laughs> these doors that had hinges that were hidden and nobody knew like which side to push. Uh, and people would get stuck in between the two sets of doors trying to like figure out how to get out. Because I believe, I'll have to fact check this, but I believe the hinges were like on opposite sides so people like really couldn't figure it out. So stuff like that I find to be interesting, just digging into you know, interaction design. If something isn't working, it's probably not your fault. <laughs> so rest assured. Um, the other book is Play Anything, which kind of uh, talks about um, kind of using the boundaries of everyday life, I guess, objects, scenarios, to find like fun or play within those things. And I guess the big takeaway from that book is that um, if you have no boundaries, it's a boring game. If you have too many, it's also a boring game. So you have to kind of figure out a way to like have limitations that you can push and play with, but not too prescriptive to where you, you can't do anything. So I contemplate that a lot when I'm writing pieces. Hopefully that'll be apparent. The other one is The Chairs Are Where the People Go. That book is about interacting with people. It's kind of about improvisation. It's written about, it's written by a person who does like theater workshops and like um, business lectures, like how to interact with people. It's interesting. It, um, so, and the other one is just basic machines. It talks, it's a <laughs> prepared by the Naval Education Training Program, which sounds not that interesting and complicated, but it's not. I read it and it was fine. And it's very short, but it goes through, you know, like basic stuff like levers, gears, whatever, just the basic building blocks. Um, and I know all this sounds kind of random and not related, but <laughs> I think reading about interaction design, design of things, how to play with them, and how the building blocks are kind of structured, at the center of that kind of is where my research lies, or at least I'm trying. Okay, like I said, boundaries and play. Um, so my pieces are often finding the limitations and boundaries of an object. And I think the next slide there's a piece which will hopefully make sense. Um, finding boundaries of structure and an interaction. So that's a lot of the scores that I write are kind of trying to 
you know, write stuff that encourages interaction and improvisation while also having a direction. Um, yeah, so balance is key. This, this picture is, um, I couldn't bring it today because I had to fly here, but it's my favorite item to use. It's a capo wheel and it's very squeaky. Um, so, okay, so a lot of the stuff I use, the found object tier of the stuff that I use includes seriously just like everyday stuff. Like this facial brush, latte stirs, which you'll see tonight if you come. Fans, you'll also see this exact brand, which is my favorite one, because it has foam um, fan blades. And this magnetic stir, which you'll also see tonight. Um, you know, that's just for like biology, but I obviously don't use it for that. Um, so these are the kinds of things I kind of have been using lately. Some of it's automated, some of it's not. All of it is acoustically pretty interesting. Okay, so now for some actual pieces. I won't play the whole thing because they're kind of long, but this one that I'm about to click is a piece um, that's shown in this photo. Oh, you will get to see the cable wheel. That's exciting. Um, there's also a record player with a mic stand and a stick, a collection of rocks, uh, some more rocks and some very resonant tin lids and a tiny record player, like a Fisher Price one with a tape measure. Those are some of my favorite little assemblages of found objects. So. I'll just play a few minutes of this so you get the gist of it.
sorry to cut it short, but it's kind of a long piece. I'll leave it playing while I chat. Um, so this piece was written um, by Tim Feeney, who's a percussionist and professor at CalArts. Um, it was written for a quartet. Obviously, there's just me. So I had to make a group of kind of automated instruments with found objects that would kind of suit the, the score. I really enjoy this video because I did not do the videography, so therefore it's very good. Um, yes, so as you can see, there's rocks, uh, river rocks and uh, aquarium rocks, the glow in the dark kind. Um, various found objects, there's a peanut tin, uh, some vases, etc. Um, so maybe that kind of gives you an idea of what I'm talking about when I say composing with unconventional instruments. A lot of these automata, um, a lot of the design problems I was thinking about with the research um, kind of came into play here because, you know, how do I make all these things work um, on their own at certain times? How do I get there? What kind of configuration of items do I need to make for it to, to do what I want? Um, the record player with the stick on it um, spinning, that was, <laughs> there was some rigging on that because it kept getting caught on the cable, so how did I make, I made like a little ski lift thing for it, um, which added a really nice acoustic element. So a lot of the, the, the sound that comes from stuff like this comes from experimenting practically um, with the items. Uh, there's a lot of rubber bands in my work, as you can see on this. All right, for the sake of time, I'm going to move on to hacked objects. Uh, this is a video from a live stream I did where I just kind of did a close-up of the objects. Um, it looks like chaos, and it is, but um, you see the um, magnetic stir, a little circuit board, which is an amp that I made that connects to the speakers. And some of these items, what I did was, um, it's acoustically resonant, but then when you connect the alligator clip in a certain series, it starts to make um, electronic noise. So whenever you click a battery, you know, it clicks. So this was kind of a way to get the clicks to, to turn on and off. Oop, this just, I just lost it. Check, check, there we go. Uh, just to get the clicks to, to turn on and off. Um, this is one where like, it's not very good for the circuitry, <laughs> so sometimes it dies. So I made extra amps, and uh, yeah, I'll show you um, the performance one. Right after this commercial. That's why I mute it while I a roulette. You never know what you're going to get. This is at Knesset Gallery in the Bay. So it just starts off acoustically with just a lot of metal scratching. I'm gonna fast forward a little just so you get to the good stuff. I'll just kind of explain it. So the record player, um, when I turn on the battery, it's connecting the metal tube that's connected to the little metal middle part of the record player. So when it hits, it makes the connection. That's why it's called Connections. It's not a very original title, but. Um, the cup, on the, the spinning cup that you're seeing now, there's foil and um, a metal, it's like a place card holder, I believe. So that'll make a connection. There's a, st a metal stick with a fan that also makes a connection. I'll play that part for you. Um, so that's just kind of how the piece evolves. So this is what I mean by hacked, where like there are found objects, but there's a lot of just like rigging stuff together, trying to get you know something to happen.
And stuff like this happens too. <laughs> there you go. So now you can kind of hear the chirping. Um, one of the problems I had to solve with this is if, if you don't have it rotating on and off, it just it stops. It doesn't do anything. So in order to get the chirping to continue, you need some sort of thing that moves, um, which is why everything here moves. All right, I'm going to move on. If you're interested in this, I will put a link up to the slides. There's some more info if you want to check it out. Moving on. Um, do I have time to play the microphone? I think I do. I'll just play like a second of it. Uh, or, or not. Um, this is an older piece. This is the one I was talking about with the app that no longer does what I want it to. Maybe one day I'll make my own, but I haven't had time. Um, so basically, because the speaker and the microphone were next to each other on the iPhone 4 and 5, it just made awful squealing. So what I did is I took a bunch of vases and oatmeal containers um, and tried to kind of rein in the feedback to make pitches. I had three very nice friends who lent me their phones, so I was able to make some kind of harmonic content in a way. <laughs> I'll just skip ahead to that part. Of course, the way you angle the phone also has effect on the pitches, so you can change the pitch w with the same object. I really wish I could do this piece again. It's a bummer. Okay, and the last little category that I like to consider is um, built, kind of constructed objects. The two top photos are um, little instruments I made. They just have contact mics on the inside, so it just picks up the thing on the top of the enclosure. Um, my goal was to make stuff that was changeable by the user without having to uh, you know, do the circuitry. Um, so the one on the, in the pink, uh, that's a slinky box, so I have a jewelry bar that's you know made for a stamp bar that attaches to the enclosure, and when you move the slinky, it makes a slinky sound. Um, and the other one on the green, that's a rubber band box, so you can change the configuration of the rubber bands to make different pitches. Um, so those are two items that I made. The one on the bottom is a prototype. Um, I just started doing uh, laser cutting and some woodworking last semester. So I took that basic machine book and tried to just kind of make something. Um, so I've been just kind of exploring, constructing things while still considering the interaction design, making sure that it's usable and has enough uh, ways to change the sound that it's interesting for someone else you know, to use it. Um, OK, one last thing, and then I'll open it up for questions. Um, of course, for tonight's performance, I've written a score, um, which is, I, it's similar concepts, but of course at a larger scale, because we've got 18 people, and um, how to instruct them how to play my 
weird ways of dealing with found objects um, was interesting and fun to work with. Um, I often write scores that are not notated, you know, traditionally, although I can, I, you know, I went to music school. Um, <laughs> but um, for a lot of it, I kind of play with the graphic notation while also some text or, or some kind of um, visuals to, to, you know, to balance telling people what to do with allowing them to kind of explore the, the item. So, um, I recently, I recently wrote a piece for the Mac Air sound. Um, so this piece, you just open up in preview. Uh, it's for four people. You open up in preview, you can press any letter and it makes that chirp sound that everybody hates. Um, and you kind of follow it like a score. So, you know, I'm trying to use things that people are familiar with while applying it to concepts that people may not be familiar with. So basically it's for four people and each person follows a line turning the chirp sound on and off. Um, so this is kind of a more, a simple way to, to notate something that really only has two functions. Um, it, it plays with the beating of the sound, so it's more interesting with more people. Um, the second one is called computer music. <laughs> I'm technically in a computer music program, so this is not really what traditional computer music is. Um, <laughs> it's for two people, um, DAW, DAW feedback, so you can route whatever DAW you use. I used Audacity for this because it's easy. You just route it into itself and it feeds back. Um, and then all of these objects are used near the Mac speaker to kind of accentuate the feedback. It's sort of similar to the microphone piece, but with m more objects. So I've written it kind of as a flowchart, which I guess is what I like now, because I wrote the piece we're doing tonight in a similar fashion, where you've got a player one, a player two, so it's kind of uh, sort of like a game, and you just pass it to each other, pass the items as they come, and play with the feedback, and that's basically it. I try to write the pieces, there's no timestamps or time signatures, so I do try to write it proportionately, somewhat intuitively, right? Every, most people know what an arrow does, so that's kind of trying to use applications of things that we already are familiar with in a new way. And lastly, tonight's piece is called How To. Um, it's also a flow chart, but as you can see, there's more words. Um, and that's because this piece was written for ensemble and I wasn't sure if people were familiar with, you know, the type of music that I usually write. So I wanted it to have some explanations. Um, also, these are not using feedback, so it was a little more nuanced on how to like use the object. Um, so I did a combination of words and some staging. I like to experiment with space, space as you perform. Um, and then I have some animations to like help read the score. I can't draw, so I used the flowchart generator. And that's kind of the gist of that one. Um, you don't have to read all of it. But if you're curious, we'll be performing it tonight at 7.30, along with some other stuff. Um, yeah, that's, that's about it. I know I just threw a bunch of stuff at you in a very short amount of time. But does anyone have any questions or thoughts? Curiosities? I can play some other music too in a few minutes. Oh, um, yes, back corner first. Whoever wants to go first. Actually, yes, absolutely. I do like to, um, fortunately, Foley artistry is kind of going away as digital stuff is, you know, stock sounds. But I do love to watch older movies um, and the practical effects in the Foley artists. It's really interesting. Um, I'm not necessarily replicating any real sound, but I do like to learn about the techniques and stuff. And it's also interesting how you can get used to a sound being allocated to a certain action, even though it's not related at all. Uh, so that's something I do consider. Good question. Yes? Can you 
That's a good question. I think I moved away from it as a kind of reset, right? Um, and then I've been exploring it lately, but not necessarily like orchestral instruments, more like bells, melodica, recorder, stuff like that. And then I use it in combination with other things like a mattress pump or a lot instrument. I'm trying to incorporate it. I have a toy piano, but I, I don't know. It's just not working for me. I'll get there. Yeah, that's a tricky question because, yeah, I mean, some people define music as like melody, harmony, stuff that you can grasp. Um, but I also think sound incorporates music, so it's kind of like a rectangle square situation. Um, so it just depends on where you draw those lines. Um, do I consider it music? I definitely think of it musically, like compositionally. Um, but I would maybe take it in the broader scope of sound because there, there is some elements that, right, are not usually heard in the traditional music setting. That's a great question. That's a transducer, which is a speaker without the tone, right? It's just a little middle part. So normally you've got the little thing that actually does the movement, and then you've got the cone around it that makes the movement bigger, amplifies it, there's a bunch of circuitry. So this thing just is an exciter, basically, so you can stick it on a surface, and it'll resonate with that surface. This is sheet metal, so it's very resonant, and if you move the sheet metal, it'll, it'll change the pitch. Yeah, it works well on like acrylic, plexiglass, sheet metal, like thin wood. But the thicker the item, the thicker the thing, the less it vibrates. So, yeah. Good questions. Yeah. Do you have any uh, artist recommendations that have been influencing your music? Oh, that's a great question. A lot of the people I'm interested in are more like sculptors and visual artists. Um, I also think about like one person I really like, and I just. I just went to Houston last weekend and I got to see all of his work, is Cy Twombly. He does a lot of like minimal kind of scribble work and some, some sculptures. So I think of things sculpturally sometimes, like in a visual way. Um, a lot of sound artists that I like are um, people who make like little automated things. Like uh, I like Ryoko Akama, who Craig knows. And um, um, yeah, there's, there's a list. I have, I'm just having a moment where I can't remember everybody. But there, if you're interested, I can give you some folks to check out. So. Anybody else? Oh, yeah. Um, this is, I guess, not strictly kind of experimental music, but I'm curious if you or anyone else you know or is interested in do uh, like resonating frequencies of a Um, yeah, there's quite a few people who do that. I mean, recently Alvin, we had the Alvin Lucier concert. Was that last year? Yeah. So he does a lot of stuff like that. Um, there's some computer music people who use um, like convolution and stuff, like the shape of a room sound to apply to their music. So there's pretty a wide range of types of music that would be interested in using room sound. And there's also... <laughs> It's a hole, it's a deep hole. Um, there's also people who will go to site specific places like <coughs> silos or big churches or caves and do like field recordings or performances in there. Um, so yeah, again, if you're interested, I can actually come up with a better list than that later. <laughs> we actually have a question from the live stream uh, do you consider your works more music or sound art, and what is the difference in your mind? That's a great question. I just tried to write a paper on it, and I got confused. And my conclusion was to be continued. <laughs> no, But um, it, it kind of straddles the line, because I do consider things visually and spatially, but it still requires a performer, you know? So my line, 
you know, between music and sound art was one needs a performer and one is more visual and requires space. Um, but as you can see, that line gets blurred. And it gets blurred in a lot of work. Um, so then I ended up finding more exceptions to the rule than I found as the rule. Um, so I guess my very basic answer is, if it's an installation, like if I had my stuff running and you could just kind of walk through it, or if I'm performing and you could come and go, maybe I would consider that part sound art. But it could be the same piece and you have to sit and watch it. And then maybe it's music. So I don't know. Yes. Oh, that's a great question. Um, some of the new things I'm thinking of is um, just fabricating more, trying to kind of hone in the sounds that I've discovered from found objects into something more specific and maybe more robust. Um, you know, both for installations and just like longer form pieces where things need <laughs> to just be a little more solid. Um, so I've been recently fabricating with a clay 3D printer and like 3D modeling like resin or clay devices. And then of course with the laser cutter I've been playing with making gears, like a gear machine kind of thing that people could interact with. Um, eventually, hopefully they'll kind of come together, but it's, it's in the research phase. Yes, uh, top first, sorry. I'm really into the solo cup on the floor sound lately, which again, if you come tonight, you'll hear a lot of it. And especially on this, this wood floor, it's gonna be good. Yeah. Uh, down here? Yeah, super interesting, thank you. I was wondering about how you often go to the wood um, viewing rooms. Is it in person? Is it a video? Uh, is there a version that just puts the audio recorder? Which I, I have a sense that that first video is the visual thing, the show and the show and the art bowl and the way it plays through the mic. I agree, you know, I'm really used to performing and I love being on the stage and doing stuff, but that video came out really good. It really did and, you know, most of the complaints and questions from people watching it is, I wish I could have seen it up close. Even with a video camera, you know, I started doing it with like a little video stream above my sets and even then it's not detailed enough, you know. Um, so I might say, I might, I might like doing the videos. Um, Audio, I've done, um, I've done a number of audio recordings too with the same thing, but I have to compose it differently because you're not really revealing the item as itself. You're kind of having to bring in the sound. So I definitely had to pare down just what was happening to make sure it was obvious that it's a new object and not just a wall of like buzzing or something. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, well thank you so much. Those were all really great questions and I hope you enjoyed it. Um, there's the live stream and I can send a link for the rest of the stuff if you wanna listen to the full piece. So, thank you. Thank you.